All right, now we're getting into the games that I know many of you have been waiting for. Whenever anybody talks about Persona, the discussion will usually be about Persona 3, 4, or 5, but how can you blame them? Each of those games added their own unique spin to the JRPG formula. Persona 3 had Tartarus and introduced social links, as well as the battle system we now know and love, even if it is a bit rough around the edges nowadays. Persona 4 had the TV world and further improved the battle system, and Persona 5, at least in my opinion, nearly perfected it by having an even greater battle system and much much better designed dungeons. However, did you know that before all of this, there was actually a Persona 1 and 2? I know, crazy, isn't it? We're going way back into the past now, right where the series began. These are the only two Persona games I have left to talk about. Well, technically three games. Persona 2 is in reality split into two separate parts. More on that in a future video. Many fans will already know this, but for the uninitiated, the Persona series didn't even originally start out as its own series, but rather as spin-offs for its Papa series, Shin Megami Tensei or Mega Ten as fans abbreviate it to. That's why in many Persona games you see the SMT title before Personas. Both series of games were created by the mighty Atlas, and the inspiration was partly thanks to the high school setting in Shin Megami Tensei If being so well received, urging them to build a new series around that idea. Although Persona had to live under Mega Ten's roof from 1996 all the way to 2012 when Persona 4 Golden released, and the series was finally allowed to be its own entity. You could probably argue all day about which of the Persona games were the most most influential of the bunch, but nevertheless, Persona ended up being way more popular than Shin Megami Tensei ever wished it could be. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of Mega Ten fans out there, but let's put it this way. Atlas announced the fifth main entry all the way back in 2017, and only just recently in July of this year gave fans any sort of update. Meanwhile, Persona was hogging all the spotlight, and with the massive success of Persona 5 at that point, introducing many new players to the series, it's clear where Atlas's priorities lied. I've had a few of you asked me if I'm ever going to review the Shin Megami Tensei games, but the only one I've ever played for myself at this time is Digital Devil Saga 1, and that was the PS3 port, which unfortunately runs way more slowly than it's supposed to. It's not unplayable, but it does hinder the game somewhat for me. Maybe someday I will go over the SMT titles, but likely not soon. I do feel sorry for the Mega Tan fans, but I hope Persona ties them over until they receive more games. We do at least know that the fifth game's going to be released in 2021, and we're getting an HD version of Shin Megami Tensei 3 alongside it, so that's something. I'll definitely give those a try when they come out. I'm also not the only one who has things to say about Persona 1 and 2, so without further ado, shall we proceed, Common? Yeah, sure, but why are you wearing the Joker get up again? What? I've worn this in my other Persona reviews, gotta stay consistent, you know? Okay, but would referencing Persona 5 even be relevant at this point? Persona 1 and 2 are entirely different beasts compared to 3, 4, and 5. At most, you'll rarely need to call back to them in this time. But, but I like wearing it. Look, I'm gonna level with you, okay? It was cool at first, but now it's just getting sad, so please do us all a favor and just go change, will you? Now? Alright, fine, bunch of killjoys. Back in a second. While he is doing that, I'll take over for a little bit. Your gracious host, Manga Kamen. Persona 1 was the first in the Mega Ten series to even be released outside of Japan back in 1996 for the PlayStation 1. Ooh. But it was under the name Revelations Persona, and to this day is one of the most laughably inaccurate ports of all of gaming. It was heavily Americanized, changing what the characters looked like, the setting they lived in, giving them English names, stuff like that which we'll go into more later. What's an is didn't receive the original version of Persona 1 until 2009 in North America and 2010 in Europe with the PSP remake. Okay, I'm back. what I miss? Oh, not much. I was just talking about Revelations Persona and the PSP remake. Oh, right. Can you even call the PSP version a remake? I see it more as a revitalized port. I mean, that's kind of what a remake is, isn't it? Anyway, the PSP version keeps everybody's appearance as they were originally. It takes place in Japan again, and the interface is more user-friendly. And the overall map is easier to navigate, instead of this ugly, confusing polygonal map that makes the PSP version make me go sick. The remake also includes additional, cleaner CG cutscenes, and an extra, more difficult route in the story to take known as the Snow Queen Quest, which was originally cut from the PS1 port. If you have to play Persona 1 in any capacity, the PSP version 
Yeah, that's probably the best way to go. It is cool that the characters haven't been altered like the American version, and has some added quality of life improvements, but I don't know. I think the graphics in the PSP remake are a little murky, lifeless, and blurry for my liking. Granted, I am recording off of the PlayStation TV, so the picture has been blown up significantly, and I know the darker look is meant to keep in touch with the depressing nature of the story, but a part of me sort of prefers the way the PS1 version looks. It's got a more vivid color palette, the picture is sharper, and yeah, the map is hideous and somewhat hard to make out where you're going, but I sort of find it charmingly hideous, if that makes any sense. Nah, not really. I know what I mean. Although I'm not crazy about having to look for crosswalks to go to another part of town. Hey, there may be demons around, but the law's the law, man. On the subject of the enemies, it is bizarre to see the original designs for some of them. Like, look here, this is supposed to be Oberon, and this is supposed to be Rangda. It's kind of fascinating. I think unlike most of the other Persona reviews on this channel, we'll cover the story for once. I've got a few things to say about it, but I'm not sure if I can without giving away anything too major. Here's the time code in case you want to skip the synopsis anyway. And no, I won't be dedicating an extended thoughts video to the first Persona. I don't think there's enough in the plot to justify making one. Really though, I'm not sure why I'm even bothering with a spoiler warning, because even after going through both story routes, I'm still not sure I fully understand what just happened. Oh, the protagonist doesn't have a canonical name in this one, and he's not a transfer student? Oh dear, that's two rules you've already broken in the Persona manual. He's gotta be a mute, has a name, and always required to be a transfer student moving to a new town. Come on, get it right. Anyway, what am I gonna call this guy? The Megami Tensei wiki only names him as Boy with Earring, so let's just call him Earring and make his nickname Mute Boy. Mute Boy and Earring? You really couldn't come up with anything better than that, huh? Well, it's not like I have much to work with. Look at him. Talk about the most generic looking Persona protagonist. I could at least tell what the later protagonist personalities are like just by a single glance, but this guy? I've got nothing, so Mute Boy it is. Moving on, in St. Hermelin High School, a group of classmates are gathered round playing a parlor game simply known as Persona. I already don't get what this game's all about. You walk around the room trying to call forth what they refer to as a Persona, and then something supernatural happens? Well, that kind of thing is what happens. A ghostly figure suddenly appears, knocking out the protagonist and a few of his classmates. This is when the protagonist is then first introduced to Philemon, who you'll eventually find out as the Master of Igor, making his debut as the ruler of the Velvet Room and helping you fuse Personas. Philemon gives the protagonist and his classmates the power to summon Personas, warning them that they may be needed very soon. Ooh, ominous. After the four wake up in the nurse's office, their teacher, Miss Sayako, suggests that they go and visit their friend Maki in the hospital, suffering from an unknown illness. Maki then unexpectedly has an episode to which everyone needs to leave the room while the doctors check on her. However, the ICU Maki's being treated in mysteriously disappears, and the town of Mikage, Cho, is overrun by demons. Perfect timing, though, because this is where we are awakened to our personas to defend ourselves. The group escape the hospital and meet with their classmate Ellie again, who tells them that Maki's mother has been injured in Makage Cho's shrine. They make their way there and she explains that a businessman named Kandori was the one who hurt her and is responsible for everything going on with Makage Cho. Kandori runs an energy company branch called Sebek right in our hero's hometown, but it's really used as a disguise to hold a machine called the Deva System that splits dimensions. Everyone then heads back to the school to check if anything's changed and they somehow come across a healthy Maki who doesn't seem to remember that she was just in the hospital, has a persona herself, and is capable of joining your party. The Persona Brigade is then decided to confront Seabek and Kandori, but after cornering him by the Deva system, a girl in black named Aki shows up out of nowhere, and the party are knocked out again. Upon waking up, they discover that they're actually an alternate, almost perfect version of their world, but there's dungeon crawling you need to do before reaching Kandori again. You have to stop the Harem Queen, who's revealed to be Maki's best friend, using her jealousy of Maki to her advantage. You have to go through the subway god knows how many times and convince one of the demons to let you pass. Then you meet another girl in white named Mai, who affects the game's ending depending on how you answer her questions before we even have another shot at beating Kandori. After quite some time, you do square up to Kandori again, who reveals his grand plan of becoming a god to reshape the world in his own image and find meaning in life. If you've played the later Personas, then this shouldn't come as a surprise at all, but to be fair, this was the first in the series to use that plotline, and Persona 1 did come out in the mid-90s, where deeper stories weren't as prevalent in games as 
they are now, so I'll let it slide. Kandori escapes again, but we eventually find his secret hideout so we can finish him off for good. There's a rather easy boss fight against Kandori and his persona, but he is finally defeated. Although this is where the story gets pretty complicated, and in my case, a little hard to follow. Before Kandori dies, he tells the group that the Maki who's been accompanying them is really the quote-unquote ideal Maki, a version of herself that the real Maki yearns to be. This ideal Maki is also the one who created the new Makage Cho when she accidentally linked with the Deva system about a month ago. And not only that, but Aki and Mai turn out to be different shadows of Maki based on her repressed emotions. The ideal Maki doesn't take this news very well and runs off into the inner lost forest to hide her face, but everyone convinces her to return to her original self. The protagonist and Maki then have to make their way to the Sea of Souls, where human life begins. And there's a very strange scene involving another version of the protagonist that speaks and shows you all the choices you've made throughout the game. Kinda trippy, really. Choosing the right options grants you the ability to fuse everyone's ultimate personas, which honestly aren't that amazing skill-wise, but the stats aren't too bad. At the end of the Sea of Souls is Maki's true self, who passes down a key needed to fight Pandora, another piece of Maki that wishes to use the Deva system to destroy destroy the world. Well, let's check that off the list as well. After possibly one of the most irritating final dungeons I've played in a Persona game, the gang make it to Pandora who's ready to face them. What the hell am I looking at? Okay, I'll admit, I know Persona games have had a lot of crazy imagery over the years, but I was not expecting anything to this extent in its first outing. Kudos to Atlas. But god, that looks weird. Anyway, the final battle with Pandora does go on for a while, but it isn't too difficult as long as you've made plenty of preparations. Not even in her second phase when she turns into a human butterfly. <laughs> sure. With enough time, Pandora is beaten, which means all the pieces of Maki will return to her original self, and Makage Cho will be back to normal. Philemon thanks the group for their efforts and unveils his mask, revealing himself to be... just some wrinkly dude. Huh, kind of a letdown. Well, the real Maki has fully recovered regardless, everyone lives happily ever after, and you get a glimpse of their futures. It's a satisfactory ending. The Snow Queen storyline isn't quite as in-depth. It still takes place in the real Mikage Cho, and revolves around a mask in the drama club that's been used while performing a play called the Snow Queen. Real original. There's a legend going around that whomever wears the mask and plays the Snow Queen is destined to die, and nearly everyone who portrayed her has perished, except for Miss Sayako, who instead lost a good friend of hers. After walking all around the school for information, the protagonist finds the mask and shows the Miss Sayako. She ends up putting on the mask, and it is immediately possessed by the evil spirit within. The spirit begins freezing the entire school as well as the whole of Mikage Cho and produces three towers that are guarded by those who are killed by the same mask. Fun little side note, this little cutscene was actually in the original. They left it in there for some reason. As the protagonist and his cronies investigate the towers, the possessed Miss Sayako is slowly building her ice castle, to which Philemon intervenes again by saying she can be saved by gathering shards of the demon's mirror. The more shards you find, the better the ending. You don't get much story after that until you conquer the towers and complete the mirror. However, from that point onwards, the group present the mirror in front of the spirit, removing it from Miss Sayako, and is revealed to be her friend that disappeared, Tomomi, who wore the mask in Miss Sayako's stead, leaving half of her face disfigured and looking like Two-Face, with the spirit being her persona. Now that Tomomi's free from the mask, she can finally rest in peace. But with nowhere for her persona to go, it ends up going berserk and turning into the Night Queen Azura, whose aim is to shroud the world in darkness. There's one last dungeon inside the Ice Castle, and the Night Queen Azura is beaten, melting all of the ice that was cast, finally ending Persona 1. Honestly, while the story can be very impressive and very good, it can be a bit confusing in my regard. Really, that's probably my fault right there, but I did enjoy the character for the most part, and I did enjoy the story. It's a really good deep dive into the psychology of these characters, especially Maki, who seems to be going through a bit of an identity crisis in my opinion, but hey, what do I know? I do think that Persona 1 kinda had its own issues though, mainly due to the fact that it got off on the wrong foot in my time. I mean, you got Mark Dance as crazy. That's gonna pretty much infect me for the rest of my life. But it's still a fun story, despite the terrible localization. I'll definitely say this about the story, more specifically the Sebek route. For a game released in 1996, it's pretty deep compared to many other RPGs at the time, and even today it's not that bad. It can be a little too convoluted at times, but a few of the twists actually caught me by surprise, which was nice. And despite not being the best story in the Persona series, I was still left with a good feeling at the end. My major issues with the plot though, aside from Kandori being a pretty bland villain, come from how poorly paced it is, and nearly all of the characters not having enough screen time to be full 
fully developed. Especially during late game and depending on how often you level grind, you could be spending at least an hour or two before the plot actually progresses, and the only conversations you can have with your teammates are in rest areas like treasure rooms in the dungeons. By the way, whose bright idea was it to make some of the treasures booby traps? I want to strangle him! There's no social link system like the later games have, so this is all the character development you're gonna get, and about 85% of the time you do spend in the game is all battling. Maki's the only character that actually does have some sort of arc, since the story mostly revolves around her, but the rest of the cast doesn't get nearly the same amount of attention. I figured Nanjo would at least get a little more development after his butler died, who also acts as kind of a father figure, but nothing really comes out of that. Aside from that, you'll only have a basic idea of the character's personalities. Nanjo is a rich stick in the mud that learns to be more loose as the game progresses. Mark is your standard Japanese nerd. Brown is a bit of a narcissist. ISA is your stereotypical dumb blonde. Ellie is smart and interested in myths and legends. And Reiji is a hot-blooded teen with a gross-looking six-pack. The problem with all of that not only lies with the few interactions with your team you have, but not everyone's going to be joining your party to begin with. The first four members are always the same. Yourself, Maki, Nanjo, and Mark. But the fifth member is up for grabs, assuming you want to take anyone else at all. However, this is really important. You're only allowed to take one other member throughout the entire game. You aren't able to swap your fifth party member once you make your decision. Your first option will be Brown every single time, but if you decline his offer, you can instead have Ellie, ISA, Reiji, although Reiji requires you jumping through some hoops to recruit him. Normally, when I first played this game, I pretty much just picked up my good old friend Brown, mainly because, well, I needed another party member and he offered. I didn't even know the first time I played this game that I could get other party members at the time, because I went into it blind as a kid in the 90s. Shut up. I mean, when you play a game and you get another party member, and considering the fact that I played other RPGs at the time, it's not too hard of a situation for me to understand that, hey, I need help, this guy's offering help, give me your help! And I naturally thought, like other RPGs at the time, I would get more party members and be allowed to switch them out. Not the case for this one, though! Yeah, I ended up shooting myself in the foot early on, too, because I went with Brown as well, not knowing that I'd be locked out of the other characters, and that was incredibly annoying. I really wanted Ellie to join my team because I liked her charisma. Either her or Yukino since I thought she looked cool and treated everyone like their mother. But for some reason she's not a recruitable character in the Sebek route. She assists you for a very short time in the beginning of the game but then just disappears after that. Yukino's a permanent member in the Snow Queen storyline along with ISA so what's the deal? As with the RPG stuff, if you've been playing the later Persona entries, then you can pretty much forget everything you know about them, because Persona 1 is vastly different to its successors. Sure, the key to winning all battles is still to abuse enemy weaknesses, but that's where most of the similarities end. Battles and world exploration is all done in an isometric grim with sprites instead of 3D models, which works very well enough for its time, and hey, I do enjoy 2D artwork most of the time. As mentioned previously, you have up to 5 party members that can attack, but unlike in newer games, you have to tell everybody what actions to perform before the turn actually starts. Also, not in the newer games, is that every character is able to hold up to three different personas, signifying that they are all as good as each other, in contrast to Miyato, Yu, and Joker being seen as special little snowflakes because they're the only ones capable of wielding multiple personas. Ooh, would you look at Mr. Popular over here? That's cool and all, but there's a bit of a price to pay when equipping new personas. Aside from the fact that swapping personas during battle wastes a turn, any fresh personas will not have all of their skills immediately available after fusing. You can check what skills the persona has before the fusion, but you'll start out with just one to start with. The only way to earn the rest of them is to keep casting any of the skills you can use with that persona. Every persona also has an affinity rank that goes up to 8, with certain ranks giving you access to another skill. However, the persona needs to already have good affinity with that party member, otherwise it ain't gonna work with you. period. I never expected a Persona game where the Personas can outright refuse to cooperate, that's so odd. That's not taking into account that using Persona skills costs the same amount of SP, no matter what it is. Say, if you've been casting Freya for a while, but your Persona suddenly required Freydine. Freydine would be costing just as much as you use Freya. It's very strange for sure. That information is just as important as choosing the right Personas for the right character. Each skill has specific attack range along the 
grid. If it's out of reach of the enemy, the skill can't be cast. As simple as that. That includes melee attacks and the gun characters can also equip in case of certain enemies reflect magic. The guns bizarrely are way more useful here than they are in Persona 5. They have unlimited ammo and you can use them as many times as you want. They're so useful that there's almost no point in striking with your melee weapons, unless it's someone like Mark who specializes in melee attacks. Any enemies that nullify or repel guns can be taken down perfectly fine with just magic attacks, so keep buying those over the melee weapons. That or you can just talk to the enemies if you don't want to fight at all. It's not nearly as basic as Persona 5 though, it's way more tricky to get right. Enemies have four different emotions between anger, fear, happiness, and eagerness. Because I guess that's all they have, the four dynamic emotions. You then need to choose which character says or does what to try and win the enemy over, with different actions providing different results. Some options have the enemy portray a mixture of emotions as well, which is even more results. For instance, if they're scared, they might run away from the battle. If they're happy, they'll be overjoyed that they might skip their turn. And if they're angry, their attack power will be increased and may bind the person who contacted them. What you really want to aim for is filling the enemy's eagerness meter. If your party's then average enough level to them, the enemy will offer you their spell card, which are necessary for fusing personas. These cards can also be combined with different items in your inventory to provide different effects, such as learning a new skill, increasing a stat, or changing a completely new persona. You need to collect as many spell cards as you possibly can because without them, you're gonna have a bad time. But some enemies can be very difficult to get a read on. You try many of your available options and sometimes it feels impossible to please them. So to save your sanity for the love of god, use a guide. Maybe use one for the dungeons too. You might have a map system, but visibility is limited. In order to fill up the map, you need to walk through every square into the dungeon. As a result, you may find yourself getting lost occasionally since the first person view and low res walls can be very disorienting. And this is something I really didn't care for. This is one of those guide games. You know, the kind of games that you need either a Nintendo Power or an actual physical guide to go through. And that was something that was a bit of a pain to deal with. Tell me about it, and not helping is the random encounters in the remake being cranked up to 11. I'm not kidding, there were many times I'd maybe take one or two steps after just finishing a battle before I'm immediately thrown into another one. You do have a run button to travel more ground, but I'd only use it if I could get away with it. I think the encounters are increased even further if you run, and you move way too freaking fast to see where you're going anyway, so it's mostly going to be run 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 ow, run 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 ow, run 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 ow. You're not even safe in the overworld. Random encounters happen there too. You're barely given a break in Persona 1, and it gets exhausting doing all that fighting. Before anyone tells me, yes, I know there's the Estoma skill to prevent random encounters from happening, but that only works on lower-leveled enemies, so unless you've been grinding before every dungeon, it's not going to be useful. You know what the battle system reminds me of, though? Persona Q. Yeah, first-person dungeon crawling, moving your allies' positions. If the protagonist dies, the game doesn't end instantly. You have five party members that need to choose their actions before the turns starts, and can also carry multiple personas. It's almost like Persona Q Beta. The only things that were different, aside from the contact menus, were having far more SP, no boost mechanics, and after leveling up the protagonist, you can set three stat points to any one of your choosing. Quick tip, put it on Dexterity and Agility. They'll increase multiple stats at once, whereas the others will only do one at a time. This is a smaller annoyance I have with the game, but I felt that there were pros and cons to splitting the XP, depending on who did the most damage. It's great that any dead characters will still get something out of it, but there's always going to be someone that needs to play catch-up. And by the way, don't try running from a fight because it's a crapshoot. Although, my god, I thought the fights in Persona Q were slow. This game seriously has it beat. They're not always this way, but some battles can be severely drawn out. Whenever a character attacks, you have to watch the Persona being summoned every single time, which you can skip in the PSP version, thankfully. Although I didn't realize I could do it until starting the Snow Queen quest. It tells me at the beginning of the game, too. I don't know how I missed it. But anyway, there are also some enemies that can perform attacks with unnecessarily lengthy animations, only to have them completely miss you, so what was the goddamn point? This is probably why the auto battle system exists. It cuts down the menu scrolling tremendously, but that's not really something to compliment on, and you'll still be talking to the enemies a hell of a lot, dragging the pace down even further. It is so freaking tedious. Some of the dungeons themselves feel like they just exist to flat out annoy you. I already mentioned having to go through the subway multiple times, but you have to do the same thing while trying to reach the Harem Queen. Her dungeon is a gigantic maze with many floors and a lot of trap doors. But even after going throughout this confusing mess, the Harem Queen kicks you all the way back to the entrance, so you have to trudge through the whole thing all over again before taking her down. Oh, joy. 
You also have to explore the inner lost forest twice. With during your first visit, you have to answer all the right questions for Mai if you want to see the rest of the game. The issue here though is that this is about two thirds into the game and five to ten hours before the actual turning point. Later Persona games would pull this kind of crap too, but at least you could save before the life changing decision. Even if you did mess up, the bad ending wouldn't be too far behind. Not near the end of the goddamn game! I didn't even know that was going to affect the ending. There was no warning whatsoever. Luckily, I just happened to get the answers right by total accident. But if I got it wrong in any way, I would have had to start the whole game again. What bullshit? Why would you do that? Persona 1's not even a greatly challenging title. It's about average, I'd say. There were some close calls here and there, especially the long-ass boss fights. But I wasn't tempted to throw my controller at my TV or snap my Vita. At least until I got to the final dungeon of Vidya World. Christ on a bike, this was awful. Never in a Persona game did I just want to shut the whole thing down and give up playing. It takes a long while to plow through, dealing with some of the strongest foes in the game. And on top of that, there's a massive stretch of road you need to traverse before reaching the final boss. Some spaces even flat out hurt you unless you have the Liftoma skill to become immune to it. For God's sake, could you give me one solitary moment to just breathe? Even when I did make it to the final boss, I wasn't at the right level to stand a chance of beating it, so I had to keep on grinding. I ain't joking. It took me at least a dozen hours to be fully prepared for this fight. At least! That's not counting all the game overs I received after less than an hour's worth of grinding and exploring. Within time though, I got everyone's levels to their mid-60s, I fused their ultimate personas and obtained all their skills including that hieroglyphin attack or however you pronounce it. It destroys everything at ease anyway, and I finally defeated the last boss. This was so far the worst time I had in a Persona game. Just this one part ruined almost everything for me. Hey John! You ready to talk about Revelations Persona? Oh good lord, I certainly am. Yeah, let's not beat around the bush. Revelations Persona is not a great port. Sure, the gameplay is mostly the same, just a bit slower than usual. Load times are a little longer. Menus are more confusing to navigate, as well as the maps. There's no run button and you can skip Persona animations. What was this good again? Okay, it has a few things different about it, but it's mostly hard to shake off how distractingly poor the Americanization is. It's a shameful attempt to cater towards Western audiences by changing everyone's names and looks. The most infamous example example is Mark, who despite having the same name was turned from a Japanese geek into an African American geek. This is really alarming. Well at least the encounter rate's been lowered a little. And since we are in an American setting, this time I've decided to name the protagonist Murica, making him the most patriotic Persona user. I hear a lot of complaints about the music in the remake not suiting the tone of the game, and I guess that's true, but I'm so used to hearing J-pop in Persona games now I just kinda accept it. Revelations music is definitely more atmospheric than the remakes, though not too memorable in my opinion. To give credit where credit's due, I would much rather take Revelation's battle theme than the alternative. Jesus, the remake's battle theme. With how frequent the random encounters are, you are going to hear the first minute or so on a constant loop. Lived in buried memory. Oh, just kill me. When I get to a boss fight, it doesn't get me pumped up, ready to truly test my skills. I'm just thinking, oh thank god, a different song. The tracks in general are pretty short in the remake. Catchy enough, I rather like school days and the final boss theme, but it doesn't take long to loop over itself. This is Persona we're talking about. They usually have absolutely fantastic music. Ah, uh, come on. You should be more like Mart. Look at him. He's dancing crazy. These are his jams, boy. Ah, yes. We truly can learn something by dancing crazy. Not much more to say about Revelations Persona. It functions okay. It was good for the time. But nothing you'll want to go back to nowadays. Especially considering that physical copies are also more expensive than the PSP version. Though you can get it much cheaper if you buy the PlayStation Classics since it's one of the games installed. Oh come on, hard copies can't be that expensive, right? <gasps> Who's gonna pay that much? Thank you, PlayStation Classic. Your library of games is crap, but you've saved me $700. I'd have to agree with Common on the game as a whole, though. Revelations Persona is definitely a product of its time and not worth playing as your first Persona game. Now then, the Snow Queen quests, there isn't a great deal to talk about with this one either. The battle mechanics are no different from the Seabeck route, although you need to run around a lot more of the rooms in the school to even access the quest, look up where to go, you're almost likely not going to find your first 
first time. The kicker with the Snow Queen quest is that you need to explore three towers in any order you choose, but they vary in difficulty. Well, that's actually a pretty cool idea, but I don't like how you're on a time limit while investigating two of these towers. To be fair, you are given a lot of time to explore, and it may not sound too bad to handle, but the real major setback for me, and the sole reason why I don't like the Snow Queen quest much either, is that none of the towers have any save rooms. You are also locked in as soon as you enter the tower with no way out until you defeat the boss. Okay, that doesn't seem too difficult, right? Well, I wouldn't have so much of a problem with this if the towers didn't take two, three, or maybe even four hours to finish. Yeah, up to four hours of game time you could potentially lose if your party dies. Some dickhead at Atlas is laughing their asses off right now. That's not fair, that's just cruel. Now, difficulty-wise, I didn't think it was that much harder than the Sebek route, but I hated feeling constantly paranoid that I could lose all of my progress at any moment. It stressed me out, which is not what I want in a video game, especially when I got to Thanatos' Tower. Holy shit, Thanatos' Tower. Good god you can't get any worse than this. It goes on for freaking ever, and if any of your party members fall in battle, they'll lose their persona, so you have to walk all the way back to this place called Tartarus, no not that Tartarus, a different one, and pick up your persona again every single time. And the cherry on top is the few enemies that have insta-kill spells, isn't that fantastic? Thank the lord Thanatos himself isn't too frustrating, although his second form loves to spam insta-kill abilities too, so for heaven's sake, reserve those magical guards. The final dungeon in the Ice Castle mercifully doesn't have a time limit, and it has another save room, but this one takes a long time too, particularly this atrocity of a maze around the middle. I'm sensing a theme here. By the time I reached the final boss for this quest, I just couldn't take it anymore. So I equipped Brown with Lilim, who absorbs elemental attacks, and Ellie with another persona that nullified them, and I just gunned it down. Yeah, I know that's a cheap way of winning, and it still took like 40 minutes, but I'm sorry, I just want to finish the damn game. And it's not like the Snow Queen quest was fair with me to begin with. Overall, not an amazing time, I have to say, but at least it's about half the length of the Sebek route. Honestly, when I got my hands in the Snow Queen quest, I actually found it to be very interesting. I mean, it was different than what I was originally expecting, and having played the original a few years back, it was actually quite refreshing. I actually stumbled upon it quite accidentally because I was one of those nerds who was bored when he was in between classes. It's like, whoa, what the hell? I do think that some of the towers can be a bit more difficult than others, and it can be a bit of a pain, especially that one tower where basically it kind of trolls you where you have to defeat its owner as soon as possible, and if you take your time, she pretty much just kicks your ass because she's been getting stronger, and the tower says, in order to beat her, you must beat her as soon as possible. And it's like, oh, you... <laughs> so, that's Persona 1. Not an absolutely awful game, but... I don't think this is a very good game either. Plenty of it hasn't aged very well, like the bombardment of random encounters, the stiff and slow battle system, the bland dungeon design, and the pacing of the story. I want to like Persona 1, but taking everything we've said into account, I just can't see myself doing so. I have played worse RPGs for sure, but this is one I'm never coming back to again, unless I suddenly start doing Let's Play videos or whatever. I believe Persona 1 is better as a visual novel than it is a game. The story itself, like I said, is actually all right and well ahead of its time, but the gameplay surrounding it, the main component that's supposed to draw you in, when it's not frustrating, it's really boring. I don't think it hurts to try out Revelations Persona if you do want to play the original Persona in some way, especially if you want to laugh for how much of a travesty the localization is, but I would personally recommend the remake over that one for a slightly, and I mean slightly, more enjoyable experience. Digital copies are very cheap, so you wouldn't be losing much money if you don't like it, but, and I can't stress this enough, play the later game games first. Persona 1 should only be played by hardcore fans, or if you really want to experience how the series started. What did you think, Common? All in all, in my opinion, Persona 1 is a decent game. It at least set the groundwork for what we could expect, and has a lot of good and positive things about it. Sure, it's not the most polished RPG, but then again, it was the first, and that's something that can be never taken away from it. Well, I'm glad you found something in it that I couldn't. Different strokes for different folks. Whew, finally, that's all done. Well, thanks for joining me today, Common. I appreciate it. It's cool. Hey, you're bringing me in for Persona 2, right? Sure, if you're up for it. By the way, you want to plug your channel real quick there? Well, thanks for having me on your channel, and you guys, don't forget to check me out. After all, I've been on a Persona kick taking care of... something dark and devious.
But take care, everyone. See you next time. Awesome, and I'll see you all in the next video as well. We're going to look at what I think is the hilariously awful Shenmue for the Dreamcast. I don't fancy doing another long video immediately after this one. Sorry to disappoint any Persona 2 fans, but we'll come back to those games after maybe a couple of non-related reviews. Thanks, everyone, for watching anyway. Stay safe, stay healthy, and take care of yourselves. So that's something. I'm also not the only one. Oh, wait, no, I missed a bit. Can you even call the PSP version a remake? Oh, God's sake. Sorry to disappoint any Persona 2 fans, but I... Bleh. Look at him! He's dancing crazy! These are his jams, boy! <laughs> oh, I sound so white bread. I sound like a kid in the 90s trying to replicate black culture there. <laughs>